Hello, and welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Andy preaches a sermon from Ephesians chapter 5, titled, Jesus is Confident in You. Seriously. Something mysterious happens when we submit ourselves to God and to one another. We speak words of love to each other like God is speaking to us. We sense the needs of those we love and move towards them. Romance will bloom, friendships will grow, you won't see your kids as problems to solve or manage, but souls you just love. Do you want this? Hi friends, good morning. Uh, every single week we do this as a church and we articulate what, we do, what it is that we believe. Uh, and we, this comes from Isaiah 61 where Jesus opens up the scroll and he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me to proclaim the good news, to set captives free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind. Um, it, this is the year of the Lord's favor. And the Lord's favor is here. God's spirit is here. And this is what we believe as a church. Number one, there's always hope beyond our brokenness. Um, all the perfect people left a long time ago. <laughs> and the story that we're in is lost and now found. Dead but now alive. And we are learning together what it looks like to stand and live in our true identity in Jesus. Confident, beloved, forgiven. Amen? Amen. Now, to trust Jesus, Jesus is alive. So he's not the force, right? Uh, it's not an idea. It's a person. And to trust or to believe or to have faith in Jesus is to listen to him and then to walk in faith, and nobody does that alone. That is not a Lone Ranger activity. That is, that is a arm in arm, we're on the same team, we're learning how to do that together, and that's what that looks. We learn to trust Jesus together. That's why we say come to a small group. That's why we say show up to a trivia night. It's just a chance to be together, and as we're together, we can then talk and grow and be together, and that's the whole idea. Uh, church is not an organization that you attend. It's a family that you belong to. Does that make sense? Finally, we get to bring restoration. And so Eric is taking a change for a dollar bucket this week. Eric, raise your hand real quick. We love you. Jesus, bless Eric as he gives that money away. Somebody, whoever he gives that money to this week is going to be, they're going to experience a miracle. They're going to say, I just prayed and God answered and you are the miracle. Do you understand that? It's through your hands that God is doing the miracle. And so that's what we are as a church. And so we join Jesus in his restoration work. And you don't need a seminary degree. You don't need a, a doctorate in religiosity. Please no. Um, you don't need to know Christianese in order to do that. You, your life doesn't have to be perfect. Ask Eric. He's a hot mess. Um, and and uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a hot mess, right? Uh, so all of us, so you, you do not... You, you do not have to be perfect to be used by God. God never, God never uses perfect people. He always uses people who are broken so that th there's no way that we could ever get the credit for what happens. Because it's all about Jesus, not about us. So each one of these truths has a choice that we all proclaim every single week as a way of saying yes to following Jesus because it's a choice. And so uh, if you want to, choose with me today. Today, I choose to be changed by Jesus. I choose to seek Jesus first, and I choose to join Jesus in his resurrection work. So can I have permission to speak to your heart of hearts? Yes. You sure? Yes. Okay. Um, today, I want to talk to you about your relationships. Today, if you're married, I want to talk to you about your marriage. If you're not married, I want to talk to you about your friendships. If you're about to get married, I want to talk to you about your relationship with your fiancé. If you want to get married, I'm not here to talk to you about your imaginary spouse. <laughs> Most of all, I am here to talk to you about your own heart. I don't know if you know this, but God never heals relationships. Did you know that? Because a relationship isn't a thing. There's, like, you can't buy a, rela it, 
A relationship just, just describes how two people interact. Does that make sense? So God heals people, and therefore their relationship gets healed. So I'm, I'm here to talk to you about your heart, about your identity, specifically about how you treat yourself and, and how you understand how Jesus treats you. So can I pray for us real quick? So Jesus, again, we bind up and silence anything opposed to Jesus that would be trying to make us fall asleep um, or distract us now in Jesus' name. And we pray for your spirit here. Open our ears, open our hearts, and we say to our own soul, awaken, O my soul. And God, we surrender to you, and we love you, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So there is this pressure that we all feel to perform, to be enough to be loved, to do enough to avoid rejection, to perform perfectly enough so that they won't be mad and leave. It's our instinct. It's our survival. In survival mode, what happens to all of us is that we get trapped in the bondage of performing to whoever it is that's in front of us to make them happy. Does that make sense? And every single one of those people have different standards. In survival mode, our self-worth is defined by how the closest person in your life sees you. And, And if they don't like what they see, you won't like you. Some of us have grown up in families where our parents or or, or, our family members or our teachers or our coaches never really liked us, and so there was always a limit to our self-worth and self-understanding. And some of you grew up in amazing homes with parents that just adored you, and so you've never had to deal with this because you've always felt like, oh my gosh, I, I am enough. Does that make sense? In survival mode, we have, oftentimes we have zero desire to submit to another person because that feels like just permission for them to hurt us. We're surviving. And so when you're surviving, I don't know if you know this, but you're exhausted and miserable. When you're surviving, you try and numb yourself because you're so exhausted, and then after, for a while it works, and then after a while it just doesn't work. And actually, the numbing makes you even more exhausted and miserable. Someone say amen. Amen. I mean, cookies don't work. (laughs) Short term, yes. Long term, no. We're surviving, but we're not thriving. Uh, Our souls long to be loved and to be healed, to be set free, to, to fulfill the, this purpose that we have, that we know that it's built into us, to find home. And then what happens to every single one of us? We're all here because of one reason. Jesus steps into our survival mode and saves us. And our lives are changed forever. And then at some point in your Christian walk, you're going to wake up and you're, dis- you're going to discover, oh my gosh, I'm performing again. I'm trying, now I'm doing this, but it's with God. I'm trying to pray well enough so he, he'll listen. I'm trying to be perfect enough so that he won't leave. I'm trying to do enough so that he'll bless me. We know in our head, Jesus, you died for me. I'm a child of God. In our heart, it still feels like we gotta perform it. We still gotta do it. We still gotta earn it. The journey of knowing Jesus is the journey of unlearning our survival mode. It's learning to submit to God, not out of fear, but knowing that our submission to him is literally letting God love me, letting God form me, letting God transform me. Submitting to Jesus is me staying on the operating table and letting the great physician heal me. Submitting to Jesus is letting Jesus free me from prison and then letting him free the remaining prisoner that's still in me. See, he's, he's taken us out of the prison, but it takes time to take the prisoner out of me. 
You picking up what I'm putting down? There's this cowboy, his name's Todd Pierce. He's a world-class uh, bucking bronco champion, and Todd takes wild horses for a living and then loves them back to life. And, and he actually has a ministry called Riding High Ministries that's in the Midwest, and it's pretty remarkable. And he takes men and women that have just been broken in life, and he teaches them how to work with horses. And uh, they, take wild, they take wild Mustangs and rescue them and bring them back to life and make them into working horses. And Todd writes this, and he always works with these horses in this round pen. And he writes this, there was this day when I found myself working with this horse in this round pen, and it seemed like every other day where I've done this a hundred times, but this horse in particular, he wouldn't stop running. And he was hitting his legs off the panels and switching directions, and he was trying to get out of the pen. And I started speaking to him out loud to the horse, which I'd never done before. And I was qu asking questions like this. Why are you running from me? Why are you so afraid? Why won't you trust me? If you would only trust me, I would show you so many things about yourself. Would you please just stop? Just look at me for a minute. And as I spoke these words, I realized that I had just got caught up in this encounter with God where this wasn't my words. This was God speaking to me. And I don't even remember leaving the round pen that day. It was as though God had just spoken these words over me as his son and was waiting for me to stop running. Todd writes, just as I could see something so beautiful and so powerful and so much potential in this horse, Jesus could see the same in me that I had never seen myself before because my view of myself is so distorted. So, we're going to read Ephesians 5 and about marriage and husbands and wives, but really this passage is about how you see yourself. So do I have permission to speak to you about how you see yourself? Yes. Yes. That'd be okay? Yes. Jesus, help. Amen? Yes. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Ephesians 5, 25. This is a recap from last week. Husbands, read this with me. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word, and to present her to, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So this is not Paul's command for husbands to give your wives showers. Um, what, is, what, am I, what is this saying? Uh, just slow down, and we're going to read it phrase by phrase. Um, so first of all, husband loves your wives just as Christ... So point number one, God loves you. Like God loves what he sees in you. God isn't mad at you. He's not disappointed with you. God sees what you've had to do to survive. God sees your wounds and the beauty that will happen when you're healed. God sees your talents and your heart that he's formed by his own hands. He's proud of you. God is confident in you. How can I say this? What's the evidence? What does it say next? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her is us, by the way. We're the bride of Christ in this metaphor. Jesus gave himself up on to death on a cross for me, for you. Jesus died so that at the same time he could kill the sin that was killing me. When Jesus took his last, last breath, as he died, he, he took on and killed the thing that's killing me so that now I'm not a slave to my survival instincts. Now I'm, I'm no longer a slave to the identity I've created in order to make it through the hell that I've endured. Jesus makes you holy now, bestowing upon you the free gift, the very inheritance of heaven. It's the Holy Spirit stitched to your own spirit. That's the gift. That's your inheritance. It's him. It's his power in you, his worth granted to you. His hope, his heaven, now, now yours. His home, now yours. Who cares about the Super Bowl? You've won the cosmic lottery. Don't you understand? You're not a problem. You're his prize. He loves you. 
You're not a mistake. You're washed clean. You're not defined by what was done to you. You're defined by what he did to claim you as his own. And Jesus, what does he do next? So he loves you and he gives himself up for you to make you and I holy and cleansing us by by speaking words of life over us to undo every single lie spoken into our souls by the enemy. That's what God does. And to do what? What's the point? Verse 27, read it. And to present her, that's you and me, to himself as a holy moly. Oh, so God's whole point in doing all of this is to make us shine. We are radiant. We are glorious. We are beautiful. He's so proud of you. He looks at you and he sees all of his life and all of his beauty and all of his creation and all of his goodness shining through you. He's confident in you. He didn't save you to then pile higher expectations upon you and watch you fail and go, she's not trying hard enough. Oh, I can't stand him. (laughs) No! No! He saved you and does the saving and does the transforming, and you've got to say yes, absolutely. He's, you have free will, but his plan and purpose and scheme is to love you and bless you because he wants you. He's proud of you. That's how he feels about you. Now, you husbands, you can't love your wife Wives, you can't love your husbands until you understand and believe how Jesus truly feels about you. You can't see another person clearly until you see how God sees you. And when someone loves you, if you don't believe that you're actually lovable, their love will ricochet right off your heart. Take it from me done it for a long time. Don't don't remember, right? The inflatable you. (laughs) Love me, I'm going to pretend and perform. I'm perfect and never tell you about any of my mistakes. (laughs) Inflatable you can never receive love, ever. Every dart and arrow and thing that would pop it or wreck it or destroy it, you have to stand in front of to take, and so you get all of the wounding and none of the blessing. That's what inflatable you does for you. It exhausts you. But that's not the story of the gospel. He claims you and loves you and washes you and cleanses you and forgives you and speaks the words of life over you to undo all of your wounding, and then he... And then he calls you his beloved and presents you and is proud of you. And as you see yourself the way God sees you, then you'll learn to see others the way that God sees them. So Paul writes this in Ephesians 5.28, in this same way, so just as Christ has loved you, in this same way, husbands... So just as Jesus sees you in the same way, husbands, what? Ought to love their wives as their own bodies. You picking up what Paul's putting down? So if you think that you're horrible and awful and terrible, what are you going to do to your wife? If you only got a tool, if everything, if you only got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You understand? Whatever tool you use on you, you will use on another, other people in your life. However you are speaking to your children, you are speaking to yourself 10 times worse. You picking up what I'm putting down? Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. You are literally now a part of his body. Paul then goes on. He's trying to make an obvious point that he can't even fathom. Anybody would misunderstand. Verse 29, right? 
After all, no one ever hated their own body. Well, you weren't here in 2024, Paul. People hate themselves all the time. But, but all of us do at least this. We feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for the church, for we're members of the body. What is Paul saying? He's saying this, you are literally now part of Jesus' body. You're connected to him by his spirit. We're connected to each other by our spirit, which means that what we go through, he endures with us, that his burdens, our burdens are now his burdens, that your struggles that you go through, Jesus actually is with you in them. And also on the flip side, all of the good things that he has are now ours. His love is now ours. His power is now ours. His blessing is now ours. How great is that? So here's the challenge for each one of us in every relationship that we have. Who gets to speak identity into you? Who are you listening to? Is it your past story? Is it what was done to you? Is it what you're, is it what you're trying to do? We sang earlier, I won't waste another day believing words you didn't say. So are you willing to let Jesus speak to you about who you are? 17. That's not bad. Are you willing to, if Jesus gives you your, since Jesus gives you your identity, are you willing then to see other people the same? Let me rephrase that. Are you willing to, to see other, other, other nice people who treat you well and love you? Are you willing to see them the same? You know what I'm going to say next. Are you willing to treat people and see people for who they are, how God sees them, who you struggle with? So five, (laughs) you know where I'm going next. Are you willing to see even those who have betrayed you and hurt you through God's eyes? One, that's Mike. (laughs) So as as I've been in the journey of healing and growing these past two years, Jesus has been speaking into me my true identity. Like I'm a good father. I'm a wonderful husband, I'm a great pastor, I'm a powerful warrior, I'm a, I'm a beautiful healer. And at every stop, step of the healing, the enemy has been attacking every single part of my identity. Because that's what the enemy does. And just this week, I had the entire staff talk to me about how they love me, about how God is using me, about how much they care. That was Monday. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna say next. An hour later, I was right back believing the lies that I'm a victim. Why? Because for years I let people speak this narrative into my life over my identity. Andy, you're the, big, you're the victim. Poor Andy. All these bad things and terrible things happen to you. Poor Andy. Oh no. Poor Andy. Oh, I deserve so much. I've been through so much pain. Poor me. I should get whatever I want whenever I want right now. Oh. You should feel sorry for me. I don't care about your pain. Just pay attention to my pain. (laughs) Doesn't matter how much I'm blessed, I'm only going to look at what hurts. Martyr, martyr, martyr. (laughs) Poor me. Blah, blah. Every time I play the victim, I lose my gratitude, I lose my joy, I lose my thanksgiving, I lose my praise. I choose resentment, martyr, sadness, entitlement. I'm right back to the survival mode of living as though I'm a prisoner in prison. You can take a prisoner out of prison, but it's a different work to take the prisoner out of that person. So on Thursdays, I'm praying, Jesus showed me this huge prison in my, in my heart, and he said, look at this, and I looked at the prison, and I realized, wait, I'm out. I wasn't looking as from the inside, I was on the outside looking, and Jesus said, turn around, and I turned around, 
and I saw you all. And Jesus said, he said, they helped get you out. They helped me get you out. See, I'm not just saved by Jesus. I'm saved into a new family. And all of the love that the staff had spoken over to me on Monday with all my mistakes and all my talents, I was so wrecked in a good way, humbled. And then, but I was ashamed. Why was I still playing the victim? And then Kurt said to me, so annoying. <sighs> he goes, well, Andy, you're human. And I'm like, yeah, but dang it. And Kurt spoke words. It was like he was speaking. He was Jesus to me. He was saying, Jesus isn't mad at you. Jesus sees you. You don't have to beat yourself up. Like, Jesus, Andy, Jesus is confident in you. So I'm sitting there crying in his office, right? I cried a lot this week. And I had to do that work of letting one narrative about my identity go and receiving the truth that Jesus is actually confident in me. Let me ask you a question. How do you want to treat the people who have helped rescue you from your hell? They're sitting beside you. How do you want to treat them? And if you're in a friendship with them or they're part of your family or, or you're married to them, how do you want to treat them? Husbands, love your wives. What does that even mean? It means that how do you want to treat the person that God is using to bring you out of your hell, to love you back into life? Wives, love your husband. What is that? That's, do you understand what Paul is saying? But you have to be able to see them clearly in order to love them. You're not just loving them so that they'll love you. You actually just love them. You're not manipulating them or performing for them or, worse yet, asking them to love you and then not receiving any love whatsoever because you can't stand yourself. That's horrible, too. You ever tried to love someone and someone says, no, 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 no. It's so irritating. <laughs> Paul writes to Timothy, and I'll paraphrase here. This comes from... First Timothy, Second Timothy, one ish. <laughs> you don't have a spirit of fear anymore. You're not bound by religious duty, afraid of failing, afraid of not being enough, afraid of not being forgiven. You belong to your heavenly Father, and He's given you His Spirit, one of power and love and self-control. All throughout the Bible, Jesus and every single one of the New Testament epistles and all throughout the Old Testament is the constant message of who are you in Christ now? What, what, what do you need to leave behind and then move forward? And then as you see yourself through God's eyes, can you see the person next to you the same and then love them? We're all in this together, united, that's why Paul says, next verse, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Like, we're all together. We're all united. So it doesn't make any sense to treat yourself with harshness and anger, because then it's going to come out on the one that you're united with, right? Eight people said yes. Let me just show you what this was like in your marriage, right? If you treat yourself with harshness and anger and disappointment and shame and worthlessness, you will, it will come out on your spouse. Do you want that? No. They're the ones that have rescued you from your hell. Is that how you want to treat them? No. So that means you have to treat yourself differently. Yes. You have to treat yourself the way that God actually treats you. Look, that's from a negative perspective. How about from a positive perspective? When you start forgiving yourself, you will forgive other people. When you're kind to yourself, you'll be kind to everybody else. What engine do you want running in your life to produce exponential things? 
Do you want the engine of bitterness and resentment and shame and frustration and isolation and entitlement? Or do you want the engine of love and forgiveness and joy and hope? You get to choose. It's your choice. And as we grow in Christ, there will be a point. There will be a point in your walk with Jesus where your survival instincts will hit you straight in the face and you'll have to say, oh my gosh, I say that I believe in Jesus. I've invited them in my heart. At some point I'm showing up to church, but I am not living with him at all. I'm not actually praying. I'm not actually living in the truth that he cares about me and loves me and will answer my prayers in real time. Real time. I'm pretending like Jesus is the force way out there, but I got to somehow figure out the magic formula to use it in my life. Or Jesus is the Bette Midler song. He, God is loving you from a distance, and, and, but I'm just alone on myself. And God helps those who helps themselves and all that heretical BS. I'm sorry. I really don't like that stuff. That's survival mode. That's not thriving. That is not faith. That is self-reliance. That is a poverty that has a predictable end and pattern in your life. Or do you want to be the person that says, I'm free, I'm loved, I'm chosen, I'm beloved, I'm worthy. I'm enough, and the God of the universe is with me. And so then we get to do things together. And look, y'all, you're now part of a sweet new gang. (laughs) We're family. (laughs) We're family now. Again, this isn't a place that you show up to. It's a family that you belong to. Like, we take care of each other's needs. No one gets left behind. You know what I'm saying? No one. The goal isn't to get more people in this church. The goal is to have every single one of you healed. If more people come, more people come. It doesn't matter to me. Like, the amount of people in this church does not, that's not a metric of success. The metric of success is whether or not you know that you're loved whether or not you sense that this is your home, whether or not your heart is healed and set free. Now, when Paul says all these things about marriage and about husbands loving wives and wives loving husbands and submitting to one another, both of you get to make a choice about doing this. And and when you both do this, it's magic. It really is. It's spectacular when you both do it. Right? When you're both like looking out for each other and going, how do I bless, how do I bless them? How do I love them? How do I take care of them? How do I, how, how do, oh, I know that's a trigger. I'll avoid doing that, right? And I know that, that they need that, so I'm going to do that. When you're oriented to them because you see them as beautiful and amazing and incredible, just the way God sees them, and they do the same with you, all of a sudden, your marriage, your friendship, your family, your, your work, All of it blooms and blossoms. It's incredible. You know what I'm going to say next. And when it doesn't, when it doesn't, it's really hard. When you give your everything to that person and they don't, it's really hard. I wish, I wish it would be so lovely that if I just did everything right, that would mean that God would take away the free will of other people in my life (laughs) and guarantee the outcome that I wanted. Wouldn't that be lovely? Right? Wouldn't that be a wonderful formula? If I just do this and say this, then their humanity will be vaporized and they will turn into the person I want them to become. And then a new humanity will be restored in them to to do exactly what I want them to do. But that's not how it works. And here's the hard truth that you and I have to live with. And this is the mystery that Paul talks about next. 
It's a mystery of what happens. Though I am united with you, you can choose to not love me. Though I am connected to you as the body of Christ or even in marriage or family or friendship, you can still say no. And if someone in your life right now is saying no, I want you to know this. That in that moment of them saying no, you will be crushed and broken. And at the exact same time, the God of the universe who is crushed and broken because of your no will be with you. And that with you isn't just something. It's everything. It's everything. And now you will know the inheritance that you truly have because he will become your only only thing. He loves you. He adores you. And let's just tell the truth. It's only by the miracle of God that I could ever see myself the way he sees me. It is only by a miracle of God that I could ever see you the way that he sees you. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would fill us with your presence that you would transform our own eyes of how we view ourselves and we would begin to, by faith, trust how you see us. And God, it's easy to love those who love us so well, but we're asking you, Holy Spirit, to do the thing that Jesus did, which was to love his enemies and turn the other cheek and lay down his life even for those who hated him. Would you show us the people in our lives that we're struggling, let us have eyes to see them as you see them. And give us the wisdom to have good, healthy boundaries and also the courage to love them. Jesus, I pray that you'd bless and seal all these good things in the hearts of my friends today. And I pray against every scheme that the enemy has to rob and steal them, uh, that which you've given them this morning. And, and Jesus, bless my Seahawks. In Christ's name we pray. <laughs> Amen. Please take a baby bottle. If you, if you can't make it to the front, we have them in the, uh, in the Welcome Center. And head across the street to go to Table Talk if you want to pray this message into your bones. Now stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance. That's his delight in you. May the peace of Christ bless and guard your heart. And all God's people said, have a great day, y'all. Pastor Andy Rock is the senior pastor of Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.